Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, I'm Curtis Wong, and uh, welcome to today's after this afternoon lecture on uh, design thinking and design research. I'm really pleased to have Bill Burnett here from Stanford University. Bill's been a professor at Stanford for 20 years, and the uh, and is executive director of the um, des the product design uh, product design uh, program at Stanford. He's going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, product design and design at Stanford, which includes the Hassel Plattner School of Design, the uh, Joint Program for Design. And uh, and uh, the design for change lab, and so uh, the talk will be about 45 minutes, and we want to make sure we have uh, at least 30 minutes or so for Q and A afterwards. So, welcome, Bill. Thanks for coming. Thank you. And thanks for the opportunity to talk to you about um, what we're doing at Stanford, and maybe a little a broader view of how we perceive design and design in the form of research. Is, is everyone here from Microsoft Research or everybody from different things? Okay. So if at any time you have questions, just let me know and I'll fill you in with a little bit of a background on uh, myself as, I go, as we go along. Um, you know, I don't, I don't claim to be the person here to tell you everything there is to know about design or, or design at Stanford. Design is a word that's often uh, used to include almost anything anybody does. Um, uh, but um, we, we have many, many groups at Stanford doing design. I mean, you could argue that people designing business models at the business school are doing design, and they certainly like to argue that, and the people designing curriculum at our School of Education are doing design. And we interact and uh, play with those guys all the time. Um, inside my world, which is the world of engineering, um, uh, we're, we're not a there's sort of two trends or two uh, worlds in the design world, the people who come out of the tradition of the art schools and the people who kind of come out of the tradition of engineering, and we're certainly in the latter camp. But in our world, we have lots of engineering. We have a huge team doing MEMS and MEMS devices. We've got people doing biomimetics. Um, we've got some phenomenal little gecko robots that run up and down the sides of buildings using uh, uh, robotic mechanisms, control systems, and little van der Waals force uh, designed feet that uh, do interesting things. And if you're ever at Stanford, I'd love to take you to that lab. The, the critters are uh, really quite interesting. We have a group of people who studies design, but not the way we study it. They study what designers do when designers are designing. So they're looking at, the, at designers and, and the ways they communicate and do things. That's our Center for Design Research. Um, that's different than what, that what I'm going to talk about. We've got a group that's doing haptics, and we've got a group that is doing what we call smart products, which is any, any embedded system thing. So all of those people live in my, my ecosystem about design, but what I'm here to tell you about is something a little bit different. It's called the Joint Program in Design and what we call the D-School. And what's interesting about us versus all the other people is if you look at the robotics guys, the control systems guys, the MEMS folks, they're, um, they're doing design and using design methodologies, but they all have a particular domain in which they exercise those methodologies. They're doing robots. You know, they're doing uh, smart products. The uh, joint program in design um, is, it, and the, the D school are two places that uh, we're, we're doing, we're studying and advancing sort of the methodologies and thinking about design, but it's not domain specific. It's sort of design across um, a, a very long lateral view. And so um, it's, it's interesting. The joint program is old. It's really quite old. We graduated our first, uh, uh, first degrees in 1963. And it's called the joint program because it's a program between the engineering school and the fine arts department. Stanford University has a kind of uh, elitist notion that we're not a trade school, we're, we're a great university that teaches people to think great thoughts, so we can't actually teach them to do anything specific, that's not allowed, we can't teach you how to make something, but we can teach you how to think about making something. 
So in the early uh, part of the 60s, there was a guy named Bob McKim who wrote a book called Experiences in Visual Thinking who sort of latched onto the notion of visualization and creativity. And another guy who came from MIT who thought that um, MIT was just teaching engineering all wrong because there's no humans in it, there was no values in it. And so they got together and said, let's do a different kind of engineering program. It'll be more of a design program, but we need some humanists early 60s, most of the guys in the engineering school were building bombs to defeat the Russians or trying to get us you know, to the moon before um, everybody else. And so they were kind of weird and they looked around the university and the only humanists they could find were the painters and sculptors and fine artists that were hanging out in a different side of campus and they got a map because no one had ever been there before and they figured out where those buildings were and they went over and they said, would you like to play? And for some reason, the artist said, sure, that sounds like it would be fun. So it's never been a traditional program. It has always been on the, on the fringe of, of uh, acceptability at the university that engineers, technologists, and artists would somehow collide and have something uh, interesting to say to each other. And better than that, they would actually you know, do something together that was, that was a different and significant. Um, it's become, unfortunately, a mainstream sort of program now. I'm actually trying to push it a little bit weirder because, you know, in the 60s and 70s, it was a very strange thing to do. And now everybody's going, oh, of course, multidisciplinary education. And all the interesting, uh, President Hennessy, our, our, our president, says all the interesting problems lie between the disciplines. And that's where the university needs to move, right? We've been in these ivory towers, these silos of pushing small amounts of information deeper and deeper and deeper to expand some body of knowledge. But the interesting problems are in the middle. So we've started programs like the BioX program, which is biology and engineering, and, and the Media X program, which is sort of everything and everything. And um, all these guys are walking around saying, see, we're interdepartmental. And we're going, we were interdepartmental when you guys were still wearing skinny black ties and coming to, the, you know, coming to engineering school. Um, and uh, you had pocket protectors. And we had magic markers. Um, our mission is to create designers. So we do in our program, we have an undergraduate program, uh, which is rocking. I mean, you get to come and study engineering and art, and, and we took out thermodynamics and put in psychology, anthropology, you know, and, uh, uh, and some other great uh, social sciences, because that's where the interesting problems lie and where the interesting solutions we think are. And then um, we want, so we want to educate designers. We want to educate people who can lead design activities, not necessarily in design profession, but lead activities that are really design activities and be change agents and create futures. Um, we also, you know, this is the group where we've kind of set, setting up labs and, ex, and experience uh, uh, prototyping facilities to try to push the methodology forward. There hasn't been that much new done in the areas of human creativity and uh, uh, innovation in a while, at least at the, at the research level. Quite new is this thing called the D-School. I don't know if you've heard about it or read about it, but suddenly D-Schools are all the rage. Suddenly we have Business Week is ranking D-Schools and uh, telling you which D-School you should go to. And everybody who teaches any design, any art, or anything remotely like that has now decided they're a D-School. Um, the D-School doesn't actually exist. Uh, we, uh, we called it that because it made the guys over at the B-School really angry because we were sort of usurping their brand and we thought that was funny. Um, and then a couple guys thought it was funny too and we said, well, you're the kind of business guys we like. Come on over and play. <laughs> um, and uh, it's actually an institute. The way you get things done at a university, even though our president says the interesting problems lie between the disciplines, uh, you can't actually work there because you're in the engineering department or the business school or the law school or the school of education. And if you teach a class outside of your school, um, they go, well, that's very nice, but when are you going to get back to your, you know, your real job here and do the research and things that you're supposed to do? So you need an institute. And so we uh, were um, nice. It was lucky enough. Actually, he found us. The Hasso Plotner is the founder of SAP the big software company. It's got quite a bit of um, spare uh, cash from that little venture of his. 
And um, he had tried to set up a sort of interdepartmental design thinking institute in Germany, in Potsdam, at the university there. But it wasn't going well. It wasn't, for some reason, working. And so he read an article about some of the stuff we do uh, at Stanford and about David Kelly, who's uh, one of our core professors in our program, uh, the founder of IDEO. And um, he's read an article in Business Week and called David up and said, what are you doing? And he says, well, I want to try to start an institute. And he said, oh, well, I was trying to do that in Germany. What do you need? You know, he says, well, we could use money. That would be good. <laughs> And so Mr. Plotner gave us um, the sort of foundational grant for this. And the D School is a place where it's a sort of, it is a safe haven. It's a place where you can be from any other part of the university and you can come and research or teach classes or do um, the kind of, you know, sort of multidisciplinary uh, learning experiences that we think are fundamental to creating kind of the next generation of innovators. But you, you know, you got into the Stanford Business School and then you took a boot camp and three classes at the D school. When you graduate, you're still an MBA. Any MBAs in the room? There's nothing wrong with that. That's a wonderful thing to be. No MBAs? All right, it's not that big a deal. Um, uh, but, but, but now you've been exposed to a very different way of thinking, right? Uh, just like in the engineering school, you've been taught sort of an analytic, reductionist, scientific model, a, a method of breaking down problems. But when you learn design, you learn a synthesis technique. Now, you know, business school person, you've learned to do models, financial models and other kinds of modeling of businesses. And now you've learned a different way of looking at those problems. And it's turning out to be a, just a, a tremendously successful experiment for us. Uh, Hasso now has, uh, is now grabbing like the faculty who taught these classes out of there and flying them to Germany to teach the people at Potsdam how to be a D school. But um, for those of you who will later, you know, send me an email or something and say, hey, how do I get into the D school? It's not a school. It doesn't exist. You can't get in. You get into something else, you know, some other real school. There's only seven schools at the university, the law school, medical school, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then, um, and then you sneak out of your classes over to our uh, prototype facility and, uh, and we'll teach you how to be um, a designer of sorts, um, but really different missions. Creating designers and design you know, thinking and pushing that methodology forward and taking this sort of out to the rest of the university and the academic community and the world at large and, and, and exploring the multidisciplinary you know, kind of team radical collaboration stuff that we think is important to innovation. So that's, that's one thing to sort of set the sort of ground rules, I guess. Um, just there's, there's uh, 19 or 20 faculty inside the department. I just wanted to point out a couple people. Um, David Kelly, who probably you know is the founder of the D School, it was his concept and he started, uh, we like to call it one of our better um, spin outs from the um, product design program. He was a graduate student uh, at Stanford with Bob McKim and Jim Adams and some of the other sort of founding faculty. And he kind of took the methodology and said, maybe you could consult this way, and that's turned into a, a nice little venture called IDEO. Um, I, I put Matt up because he's the other sort of other side, the other anchor of the joint program. He's in the art department. Uh, he has been teaching continuously since 1957. I was mentioning to um, uh, Jim and Curtis that he's been teaching almost half as long as the university has been around, right? So 57 to now is like. 50 years, no, actually 1953. He's been teaching 54 years or 55 years. Uh, same syllabus, hasn't changed it. It's brilliant. it's brilliant. He now has the grandchildren of his first students who've been sent back to Stanford to take Matt's classes. Um, and he, he anchors from the art, art side uh, the, uh, the, all the other issues that uh, we bring into design. And then we've just recently appointed, I'm the, uh, the executive director, sorry, I'm the executive director um, uh, which partially means I do this kind of stuff and I teach and I'm supposed to executively direct the program. That means raise money. Um, uh, Benny Banerjee is our new academic uh, head of the program. Um, and uh, he, uh, he's another, you know, it's interesting to try to find academics who can do this kind of stuff. He has a degree in architecture, degree in engineering, and a degree in design. 
And so you add all those up, it's almost like a PhD, and you can sneak them through the university. Because they're so far, as, as we look around the world, there aren't really PhDs in, in, in this kind of design activity. There's certainly people studying how designers design, but not designers who use design to innovate and research at the PhD level. So these are the, the people I have the tremendous uh, luck to get to work with every day. And uh, we're starting a thing we're call, uh, uh, designed for change or designed for rapid change. One of the things that um, we uh, strongly believe is that design, it, to some extent, is the reason we're in the mess we're in and has a responsibility to sort of fix the mess we're in, uh, in energy and environment and uh, the way human beings relate to their machines and, and technology. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of obvious that the rate of change is changing. It is getting faster and faster. And that the level at which we have to um, uh, sort of design systems uh, is changing as well. And so we're start we've started a lab. It sort of lives because it's easy to be, um, it's easy to break the rules if you live between, you know, things. It sort of lives between the D school and the School uh, of Engineering, the Joint Program in Design, and and uh, that's where we're we're sort of studying three topics, and we call it the D Lab, of course, because everything now it's D something D. It's like McDonald's. I don't know. It's weird. Um, we call it the D-Lab, and what we're studying there, um, global issues, which is a sort of larger word than sustainability because we're tired of sustainability. It's, it's becoming almost a meaningless term. Um, but looking at things in the world, at, at, in the environment, um, at a, both a product experience and a service level that impact, so going forward, the sustainability of, of uh, culture and life on the planet. We're looking at technology futures because technologies and certainly the kinds of technologies you, guys, you, you, you develop every day have a huge impact on whether or not the future we have will be um, uh, better or worse than the one we have today. Uh, and also looking at the dynamics of change, how change is implemented, how organizations implement change, how we as societies implement change, and what are the, the sort of seed functions that cause those changes to occur. So that's, that's what we're doing there. Um, the criteria for things that we're looking at, um, this is, a, this is the, the joint program in design always, has always started kind of with two things as, as it's, as, you know, the, the core, I guess, philosophical underpinnings of the program. One is, is that it's human-centered design. We're dealing with things. We're not interested in optimizing uh, transmissions for cars. Although transmission design is an interesting, you know, experience, and lots of our mechanical engineering uh, friends do that, and uh, we, you know, compete in the DARPA challenge with our little robot car, and we've got another car that is a completely software-driven fly-by-wire car, and we love cars, um, but we're more interested in how humans interact with cars and what the problems and uh, and the opportunities are there. So it's a human-centered approach coupled with uh, lots of interesting sort of experiments and um, research around uh, fundamental creativity. What causes human creativity? What, is the bound what are the boundary conditions that stimulate more or less human uh, innovation at, a at an individual level? So we're looking at human-centered problems since where sustainability and other issues come into play. We're, 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 we're interested in big problems because there's lots of big problems right now. Um, and uh, somebody better get on it. Um, strategic things, things that have some kind of an impact where design uh, is not about, uh, you know, say objects or object uh, level problems where they're strategic. Um, you know, for a long time the program was called the product design program and it dealt very specifically with designing Products and you know, products could be for one person or for many people or for you know they could be anything from laptop computers to you know ergonomic chairs. Um, more and more, we find designers are being asked to elevate their game and to talk about things that are not simply the product, but how a product becomes a strategy or a strategy um, for a company, for a, for a, uh, a municipality, an urban environment, or a larger environment. They're being asked to, you know, kind of 
look at how um, the experience of the product affects the person and the user, creates either the brand or the awareness or a larger set of experiences, or how a service is delivered. Um, we just did a project with the Stanford Medical Center. One of the nice things about Stanford is we do have kind of one of everything. So if you want to look at how doctors are all screwed up, you can go over to the medical center. If you want to look at how, you know, education's all screwed up, you can go over to the School of Education. Um, where they think it's screwed up too, by the way, and they're looking for help. I'm not, I'm not being critical. Um, so we go over to, the, you know, redesign the experience of going to the emergency room. How many people have gone to the emergency room? Great experience, huh? High service, really felt, <laughs> cared for, nurtured. Your, your, not only was your wound taken care of, but your psychic, you know, uh, being was, um, was comforted. No, it's, it's really bad, and it's really bad for a lot of reasons that have nothing to do with the, the, the uh, implicit design of any one of the elements, but the experience is very bad. And what was interesting is one of the methods of discovering how the experience is bad is you check yourself into the emergency room with a, some kind of a problem, and, and then you just have a video camera that you just sort of walk around like this, and you take a video of the entire experience. One thing you notice is that the video is about eight hours long. Right? So that's one problem. The second thing you notice with the video is that most of the video is um, uh, a video of acoustic tiling. You spend most of your time in the emergency room on your back staring at a blank ceiling and wondering when someone's going to help you. And that's not a very nice experience. And actually when you show it to people who've been in that, you know, who work there, nurses and, and the triage nurses and doctors and everybody else, they go, gee, I had no idea. Even though I'm around this every day, I had no idea that that's actually the visual experience of this entire eight hours has mostly to do with acoustical tiling. Of course, then they go, maybe if we had got better tiles, <laughs> this would be better. And, you, and then you take them through the rest of the design process. So um, we're looking for novel results. Nobody hires designers to do something they could have done themselves. And, we're, and you know, obviously, we think that the interesting problems are the multidisciplinary problems. And what we really want to get to is some understanding of how things change. I often tell my, my early, early you know, foundation design students, you know, we're going to teach you to be magicians. Because what's a magician do? Well, they go, you know, you know da -da -da, and then poof, they make something appear, right? Something appears out of nothing. They make a rabbit, they pull a rabbit out of a hat. They make, uh, or they make something, they make a motorcycle disappear. Well, that's what designers do. You think of something in your head, nobody else can possibly imagine it. It's the perfect sleight of hand, right? It's all in here. They can't see it. And then uh, you go into the shop or onto the, you know, computer and out comes something no one's ever seen before. That's pretty magic, right? That's a pretty magic thing. So how do you get that to happen? How do you, as, as Kelly likes to say, how do, you get, how do you get in the position where you innovate regularly? It doesn't make any sense, right? Innovation is the thing that happens only once in a while. How do you innovate regularly? And, and more, we were just talking about the issues of research versus development versus productization. How do you get things that you have caused to appear as, through this magic process by design, how do you get them to stick? How do you embed them in a culture and get them to be useful and get them to change people's lives? And what, what are the characteristics of things that do that? It's a really interesting question. And, and obviously, if you could do that regularly, it would be tremendous value. Because you, you would know that your solutions would work and that they would impact people. And there would certainly be, at some level, a commercial value to all of that. Before I get to Stanley, who's my favorite grouchy critic, any questions so far on just that framework? That's what we do, Stanford. Um, we just somebody just rated us as the second best industrial design graduate program in the country, and I'm just absolutely baffled by that because we neither teach industrial design nor do we belong to the IDSA, nor do we um, understand how the hell we got on that survey. We didn't participate. We didn't, we didn't. We're very flattered. We feel very bad for the schools that were rated below us because they tried really hard to get on that survey. And I don't even think I returned the guy's phone call. Um, we're not an industrial design program in that way. And there are some great programs. 
so the other thing I often spend my time doing is as the many, many requests come in to apply to the university, sort of sending people off to Art Center or sending them off to the Rhode Island School of Design or IIT or some of the really, really great schools who do come out of the art tradition and approach design with many of the same tools but with a different, a real different point of view. So the disclaimer is, if there's any, any industrial designers here, yeah, come to our school and we'll teach you all the rest of the stuff that they forgot to teach you in, in design schools. But idea is phenomenal and it's important and it's, uh, you know, it's incredibly uh, valuable. Um, but we've always come from a slightly different tradition. And, you know, and I, lo I love this quote. Uh, if you don't know Stanley Crouch, he's a jazz critic. He won one of the Genius Awards. He started the jazz at Lincoln Center with Wynton Marcellus and he's a total crank. Um, uh, and he gets into fist fights with other critics and I love him for that. Um, but he's, he's written quite a bit on jazz and also about uh, everything else. And I love this quote because it's like, this captured for me sort of what, why design? Why don't, why don't you just, you know, science works, engineering works. You can reduce lots of problems to very, you know, very fixed variables and you can, you know, isolate independent and dependent variables and solve um, problems in a very logical way and we don't not do that. We come out of the engineering school. We believe that's important. But in, in you know, the age as things are moving quicker and quicker and, our, uh, and the exchange of information, we used to exchange things. I used to give you a spear and you gave me a rock or something. I don't know. But now we just exchange information. We exchange data sets and software and other things. It's not tangible. And our technologies become more intricate and difficult to understand and reinvention of the world of work, organization, and careers will become, I believe they already have become for most of us, more and more closely aligned with the jazz ensemble and we'll see that empathic individuality, what jazz musicians have for each other in the moment, in a combo where they respond in kind to the last thing you did and the next thing I'm going to do and the next thing you do, that empathic individuality is the way we will all end up working, right? And we'll find ourselves improvising with greater and greater confidence. And I love this, and fearing less the imaginative powers of the individual because they're committed, you know, to uh, improving the whole. This notion, um, there's a whole another sort of way in which jazz and, and the way, you know, you work are related and the way you think are related. But the mo one of the more interesting, you know, examples is if you get four jazz guys together and they start playing and then you say, stop. First of all, they'll go, well, what would you stop us for? We were just getting going, you know, and you say, what's the next thing you're going to play? What was the next note? What was the next note? They'll go, I don't know. I don't know. You know, if you, look at jazz if you look at jazz music versus classical music, in classical music you have a score which defines every note you will play and actually how you will play it. There will be notations about fortissimo, pianissimo, the way the, uh, there's, a, there's a range of interpretation. A conductor can take a symphony and stretch it out five minutes, shorten it five minutes, play some sections faster or slower. But it's highly prescribed. It is completely encoded that the will of the, of the composer is there. Jazz musicians have what's called the chart. It lists simply the chord changes relative number of bars of each and the melody. And that's, uh, remember in Pirates of Caribbean, the Pirates Code, it's more of a suggestion. It's not really the way you have to play the piece. And if you get excited and decide to take a 32 bar solo instead of the eight bar solo that we practiced, and it's good, and it's good, <laughs> then it's all good, right? And I can't stop you and ask what you would do next because you don't know. You know, but you can't tell me. And you know because uh, if you kept going, the next thing would be obvious. But if I stop you, then the next thing, the, the context is lost and the next thing is not predictable at all. How many projects do you guys work on that feel exactly that way? You know exactly what you're doing. You don't exactly know where you're going. Um, you know, you know that jazz will end. The piece will end eventually. You will ship the product, you know, someday. But in the middle, you know, how much time do you attend to listening to each other and playing off of each other and finding opportunities to enhance the music and the experience? There's a whole other thing about jazz, but I just, I think 
I think it's the reason, it's one of the reasons why a design approach is starting to become something people turn to. Because we have this thing we call design thinking. And we, we, we say it's these things, but other people say it's other things. But, um, and nobody used to pay attention to design, and then suddenly Kelly started saying design thinking, and everybody said, oh, well, if it's thinking, then it must be important, so we'll pay attention to it. And this is, you know, it starts with creativity. It starts with a human being in that moment where at one side of the line they have no ideas, and suddenly boom, they have an idea. It came in the shower. It came after, you know, a brainstorming session, or came in a brainstorming session. A brainstorming session is jazz in, incarnate in idea formation. Be very careful who you brainstorm with. You don't get to sit in with the Miles Davis Quartet if you're a crappy bass player, okay? Because they're going to throw you out. You've got to practice your instrument. And you have to, because you can't be good in the spontaneous moment if you can't play the scales, right? So brainstorming is much, most people say they do it. Um, you know, when I go and watch them do it, I don't know if it's really jazz or just noise sometimes. But um, creativity, brainstorming, idea mapping, ethnography, we teach, if we teach only two things in Stanford, and I think sometimes we don't even do that well, teach you how to have good ideas, and we teach you to match those ideas to human beings' needs. Humans can't tell you what they need. You have to watch them. You have to be like an anthropologist or an ethnographer. You have to go to the village where they live and live with them and watch what they do and listen to how they report it. But it's what they say they do and what they do is different things. And in the dissonance between those two is a bunch of nuanced data about how they want to represent themselves and versus how they actually are and what they do. You can watch surgeons, you know, doing complex operations with the worst possible information systems, ergonomics, lighting, everything, and you'll say, is there anything wrong in this, in this operating theater? And they'll say, no, it's great. And by the way, I'm really good at this because I've learned how to do a difficult thing in a tough situation, and that's my value added. They don't actually want you to change it. But that's, you know, that can only be seen through observation. We look at technology and business and systems level. We're looking at, a, you know, it's always a systems level understanding. We're not at the analysis side. We got all that covered in the engineering school. We're the synthesis side of the school. And rapid concept generation, which is about envisioning, could it be this, could it be this, could it be this, what about, what about this idea? A lot of storytelling, and uh, my first connection um, to uh, Curtis was some of the storytelling ideas that he had in, in some of the early um, uh, CD-ROM stuff we were doing. But there's storytelling is the way humans, you know, have always exchanged information. So we we're just telling stories about a future that might be, right? So we teach our students how to tell stories. Um, Sense-making, you know, road-mapping, strategizing. The, the Design for Change Lab sort of uses this model of intentionality, expression, and, and, and implications, and it's a, it's a circular thing. And I'll explain that in a second, but I just, I, I, I highlighted this word because I wanted, there's a lot of things we could talk about. There's a whole design process thing that we do. But I wanted to talk about prototyping cause, because it's one of the more subtly, it's a more one of the more important things that is often subtly misunderstood. By prototyping, I don't mean making engineering models of something. By prototyping, I don't mean the thing you're going to test to see if it breaks. Th those are certainly prototypes, and there's lots of things that can be prototypes. But prototyping is, is a, in, in the process, in the design process that we do, is about thinking. And we have this phrase called building is thinking. Now, some of this, remember, it would be better if I came out of the art school tradition, I think, because I wouldn't have to always be arguing with the, my engineering friends in my department about what am, what, you, what am I doing? What are you guys doing? First of all, you spend a lot of time in rooms drawing on the walls and laughing. That doesn't look like work to us. Well, that's brainstorming. That's really a very subtle process. And you don't understand it, but it's good. Okay, and then, and then you're always making stuff in the shop. But isn't that like, um, isn't that what technicians do, making stuff? We say, no, 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 building is actually thinking. Because there was for years and years, and there still is in some, some parts of the engineering and, and science and technology world, the notion that I'll figure it all out. If I just had all the data, I could figure it all out, design it, design it on paper in a CAD system somehow, make a completely virtual thing, and then someone would make one, and then I'm done. Right? 
Because if, if I literally had all the information I needed about the thing, I could just make one and then I'm done. So the thinking comes before the making. It's a planning and analysis process. And it's fundamentally flawed in the kind that that kind of thinking doesn't work in the kinds of problems that we're trying to address. We believe you have to build your way to an understanding through building things. And almost anything can be a prototype. I mean, I've seen, I've been in meetings where it's just been a complete disaster and then somebody takes a piece of paper and folds up a little something and says, is this what we mean? And suddenly, you know, uh, uh, everybody kind of says, yeah, that's, yes, no, yeah. And suddenly the meeting is now focused around something. So a prototype can be a spreadsheet or a piece of paper or a foam core model or, you know, six popsicle sticks glued together. And it can be more elaborate than that. Um, but prototypes have some fundamental characteristics. One, they're always incomplete. They have some reduced dimensionality. It's a picture, not a video. So we took out time. It's a video, but it's a crude video with, you know, animation without the full-blown thing. So we took out resolution. Or it's only simulating one aspect of the experience that you're going to have. And so it requires suspension of, of uh, you know, the reality of the true situation and sort of emerging yourself in some aspect of the situation that you want to discover something about. Prototypes... Engineering models are, are about answers, finding an answer. Will this break? Prototypes, good prototypes, design prototypes, are about asking better questions. If I gave you this, what would you do with it? If you, it, does, this do, does this make you feel the way I want you to feel when you have this experience? It's about asking the next level of questions, and it's a kind of peeling the onion you know, process. And it works particularly well when you have these badly behaved problems that are multidimensional. Prototypes, if, they, if they're truly good, they will induce experiences. That's their purpose. Right? It cause you to believe that you are now participating in the service product or experience that I'm trying to design. And, and they create emotional participation. And the other subtle thing is everybody, even when they get that to that level of saying, okay, that's the kind of prototype we're making. They think it's about the user group they're studying. I'm going to make some prototypes. I'm going to take it back out to the emergency room. We're going to try this experience and see if painting the ceiling tile, tiles with, you know, beautiful pictures of, of Paris make the experience better. And you will get a reaction back from your users when you do these kinds of prototypes. But it is equally as important to uh, use the prototypes to build consensus reality on your multidisciplinary team. Multidisciplinary teams, by their nature of coming from different disciplines, don't share language in common, don't share... Let's see, do I have that? Yeah. Sorry, let me go backwards. Um, they, don't, they don't share semantics in common. They don't share sort of social understandings in common. And they don't have organizational uh, norms in common. So we all come to the table to work on something together, except my idea of what a co-can is all about and what you're in, and, you know, marketing's got a view and engineering's got a view and manufacturing's got a view and the users have a view. Prototyping forces um, us to agree that the thing we're talking about, particularly because we can experience it, even if it's not physical, it was an experience design or a video we made together, causes us to create um, a, a sort of concentric view of the thing we're working on. I'm sure we'll get lots of hands if I say, how many times have you worked on a project in a big team where it wasn't really clear if everybody was working on the same thing? Or at least everybody agreed on the thing that they were all trying to work on, right? That's really hard. Human beings in large organizations have a hard time creating those consensus realities. So don't underestimate the value of prototypes to do that. In fact, it's um, uh, most, if you actually look at the way prototypes in this context are used in large organizations, they spend most of their time inside the organization creating communication and very little of their time actually in the field interacting with users. So they, 
They aren't something you take out and then put back in your drawer when you're done. In dealing with, when, when you're dealing with these jazz style problems, I think almost everything we do nowadays has got so many parts to it that it is an improvisational uh, reality that we're creating. Um, prototyping builds these consensus reality and creates convergence on a solution. And up in the hills behind my house is a sculpture garden, and this is uh, Andy Goldsworthy has made these really crazy, um, they're about yay big ceramic pods that are sort of, you know, uh, a thing inside a thing inside a thing inside a thing inside a thing. There's about 20 of them scattered on a hillside, and then he's just let the, you know, the sort of moss and stuff grow on them, and they're just magical things, and, and they seem to, you know, have no end in the middle, but there's this lovely sort of focusing of concentration as you experience them. And I think that's what you look for in projects. It's what you look for in design, is to start with something that seems very vague, and somehow you get it down to the thing that's just right. And when it's just right, you know it. So again, in, 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 the world of, in the world of the academy, where PhDs are given for advancing the body of knowledge, and therefore you try to select the smallest possible slice of knowledge you can find, and push it just a little bit forward, get your degree and leave. Yeah. Um, research has a very loaded set of, um, of values around it. It has to be verifiable and quantifiable, and it has to be iso you know, isolate the thing you did and demonstrate that it is different than what everyone else has done. Design you know, comes from a sort of a different culture, and it's often not included in the research you know, um, uh, culture in the research world. Or it's something that's thought of as you add that on later. You know, just a, you know, smear a little design on the top and it'll all be pretty. Um, but, but I think there's, there's value. First of all, designers, just as a, as a lot, um, are really comfortable with these fuzzy boundary conditions problems. They, they always start out with something that nobody knows anything about and then they're expected to come up with something cool and that's just their lot in life. And we were talking about a design is taught with a sort of, I, I give you a problem. It's the first time you've ever done this. You've been in this situation, I give you a problem. It's the first time you've ever done it. And then I get 20 people who have 30 years of experience in the industry to tell you all the things you did wrong. That's called critique. And it's a wonderful experience if it's the first time you've ever been through it. I get to advise all the undergraduates, so they come to my office in tears. Saying, I didn't like my, I did a lab and they didn't like it. It was horrible. And they told me it was bad. And I, and you know, you got to understand that Stanford undergraduates have never been told anything they've ever done is bad, right? So it's a, it's a tough experience. So they're used to that. <laughs> and they're used to, you know, and they used to be given the wrong boundary conditions. They're used to having these kind of giant problems, really not, not clear cause and effect between any of the variables in the problem. And they're still expected to come up with something brilliant and unique. So they're just, you know, we abuse them. Uh, for you in school, so they're prepared to tackle these kinds of problems. And they've been also taught as a culture sort of a bias for action. They, they only are happy if they have a creative solution. They're not happy if they have an okay solution. They're not happy if it's not radical. They're proactive. They, they tend to want to build stuff before they understand uh, why they don't know enough to do that. Um, you know, they, they communicate visually, which makes them actually fairly easy to talk to because they'll just show you what they did. You don't have to read it or go through a long email. They'll just show you something. And that leaves them vulnerable to you saying, well, I don't like it. But th th it's OK, because they've had professors tell you them that for years and years, so they don't mind that. Um, and uh, they tend to, you know, if, they, if they're coming from the right orientation, be human-centered and holistic, and they, they, they want to synthesize things. They want to take things and put them together and offer solutions. So it's a it's kind of a, a different culture, I think, that helps, um, if nothing else, visualize and catalyze research in a way that allows more people to participate. And the way we're using it is this sort of, you know, I, I've turned it into a little mini pyramid. Um, if you want to do, I mean, everything on the, on, the, on the slide about culture, every one of those things is actually a value. It's actually an emotional or a value statement. 
we believe that radical is better than conservative. We believe that holistic is better than uh, you know, analyzing the parts. So designers start with some intentionality. Right? You're asking a why question. Why are we doing it this way? Why are computers so hard to use? Computers are hard to lose, use, and I apologize for bringing this computer into this wonderful place, but this is a piece of crap. It's really hard to use. And, hmm? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, and it's only marginally, you know, less hard than all the other computers in the world, and, it's, and those are hard to use too, and, um, you know, there's this $100 notebook for everybody, and that's hard to use, and they're all hard to use. Why? Why, why is this still a problem after all these years? Um, you, ask, you ask questions that have that level of intentionality in them. Right? You build these nuanced data sets, and there's a whole other talk about you know, ethnography and how you, create a, you, how you create a data set that captures the nuance, and then how you actually end up with that in the real product. We were also at lunch talking about how come, you know, we work with Ford and BMW and GM uh, and uh, um, Toyota in our, in our uh, some of our research projects. And uh, we worked with the research labs in all those groups. And you'd think, wow, but Toyota and BMW are really cool. I'll tell you, the guys at GM and Ford have brilliant researchers and great car ideas, way ahead of some of the stuff BMW is doing. But it never, you never get to buy it. It never comes out. There's a, something at the other two companies that, that takes the data and kind of midwife sit through the whole development process and make sure that the nuance isn't lost. Right? That people don't forget that the user said, I don't buy um, these things because of the size of the engine. I buy them because the cup holder holds my cell phone. That's why they buy them, right? Um, so the nuance data set, we create expressions, which are prototypes because building is thinking, and then we use the prototypes to challenge the data set, because the data set's always wrong, or wrong if, if incomplete is wrong, it's always wrong, and use it to do the consensus reality. We draw out the implications then, because it's not just, you can't just throw the data on the table with the, with the prototypes. You have to make a conclusion based on your, your value system. What, what are you trying to do here? This is that focus that some companies seem to have about getting the product right, it's not all right if just because you, you did what the spec said. That's, not, that's an internal representation of the consensus. The real consensus is out there someplace up, up with the users that you spend a lot of time with and understand you think their needs at a nuanced level. So you take those things back out and create scenarios, and you test those scenarios, and that causes you to ask new questions. And, and the reality is you're never done with that problem. Someday you do ship the product or implement the system or create the experience. But there's always, you know, more to do. And so what we're doing in, in, the, in the lab is looking at <laughs> issues around sustainability and what the sort of closed loop of, of the product cycle is and how people perceive their products, how that perception is changing, and what they want out of that experience with products. Um, what I love about the sort of, you know, the newly energized crop of, of students that we have coming through school is they're going, don't teach me how to make landfill. I'm not here to learn that. I really want to learn how to change the world, which is great. In the 80s, I, I always ask a question. Maybe I don't always ask it, but I, I often ask a question, you know, what would you work on? It's sort of, what, what are your values? What would you work on? You know, and, I, and to make it extreme, I said, would you work on, you know, building nuclear weapons? How about detonators for nuclear weapons? How about, you know, refining plutonium for nuclear weapons? In the 80s, I got about a 50-50 split. If the money is good, sure. What the heck? There's no, you know, there's no consequence to my action. I'm just uh, another person. Nowadays, it's like, don't teach me how to make hair dryers and pretty computers, because that's just crap. I want to learn how to change the world. So it's exciting um, because that the students are coming in with intentionality, you know, that I, that, that I think is, is refreshing. Um, let me give you a, an example of this sort of indicates extreme prototyping in a point of view. There's a graduate student of mine, Carissa, um, and she uh, is just the first quarter of her thesis work. 
in our graduate program, you do a, a sort of a foundation year, then you do a thesis year. And one thing that's cool about it is you get to pick any topic you want. And she said, I'm going to do intersections. And we all said, what the hell is that? She said, oh, I'll show you. And she started looking at the, uh, and this is sort of her, her project uh, uh, review at the end of this quarter, just last week. Um, she said, I want to look at um, people, and I want to look at space, and I want to look at like how people in space and what is the intersection? What causes comfort? What causes discomfort? What causes connection? What causes? So she ended up sort of just defining it in this little triangle. There's public space, self, and others. And she started doing a process of prototyping. And this was an interesting one. She did this. Rat the first thing she said, "You know what? I'm one of those people who like to wash my hands. It really bugs me when people don't." So she went to the women's room in the engineering uh, uh, building, and she installed a second doorknob. They both work. Quick prototype, did it in an afternoon. Said, okay, so here's the deal. It's okay if you don't want to wash your hands, just use that door and that, that handle. And then she uh, sort of videoed and observed the reaction to this. And um, the, the interesting conclusion, I don't know if you can read it there, um, the, uh, she said the interesting part wasn't so much whether people did or didn't use which handle. It was how you instantaneously formed an opinion about the person as they exited the room. They could no longer hide their behavior and how that changed, you know, the relationship you had with them. So oh, oh, I thought it was a, an interestingly weird and insightful prototype. She then took over all the elevators from the engineering building for about four weeks and started doing a whole bunch of other prototypes because she thought elevators create an extreme user scenario. Right? You're stand, suddenly standing in a close space with a bunch of people that you've never met before. So she did a talking elevator. Um, she just installed a speaker and had some people record some voices, and the elevator just talked to you. It didn't actually. Uh, she hid. She she was in the in the elevator for much of the day triggering the voices as if there was a sensor who could detect what was going on. But nobody knew she was the trigger, although people started wondering who this weird woman in the elevator was after a while. She did another one in the elevator where she projected, um, uh, she project, projected light that looked as if it were reacting to your position and discovered that people could interact without eye contact by, by maneuvering you know, the way the light impacted people, it would you know, bounce around and jump from place to place. Um, all totaled, and we had 10 week quarters, right? so she had about nine weeks to do this and then ended up um, in the 10th week making a presentation. She did three, six, nine, 12, she did 12 prototypes, 12 full on prototypes in nine weeks. This is, what, I didn't show you this, but this is one of my favorite ones. You know, you know that thing where like you go to the gym and you get all sweaty? And then you're all sweaty right here, and you're all sweaty right here. And so your gray shirt turns kind of dark here. I'm sorry. Keep hitting the microphone. Um, so that not only is that embarrassing, it's particularly embarrassing for women. So she designed a sweatshirt that had, um, the, the, like, the more you sweat, the more it becomes all the same color. A T-shirt that, like, has a, a white patch here and white patches here. So as you sweat, it just becomes a gray T-shirt. Very interesting kind of interaction. So she... She put, and then she put all of these prototypes, uh, personal space thing, a cultural space indicator. She did, she did an uh, elevator floor that, depending on where you stood on it, it created a little gravity, a little sort of a deflection in the floor. And then the floor was filled with ball bearings. So if you got in the elevator and stood here, all the ball bearings would kind of go <laughs> until someone stood over there. And then some of the ball bearings would fall over there. And, she just, she just really played with this notion of self-space and uh, others, graphed all of these prototypes into this, you know, model she evolved. And actually, the model, you know, sort of changed over time and is now researching what happens in here and what will happen when you take these intersections into second life. What happens then? Does something else happen? Are we the same in, in, in physical, the physical world and we are in the virtual world. And she has a couple of other things she's proposing to do after that. Um, I, I just used that as an example to sort of ground some of the discussion. One, 12 prototypes, nine weeks. 
all of them work at the level which people can interact with to a uh, couple dozen lines of code but didn't spend a whole bunch of time inventing sensors that could detect the location of a person in an elevator. You don't need that. You just stand there with a little thing in your hand going, <laughs> right, because that's not the problem. The problem is to see what people do when they're in that in experience. And the problem is to understand how they navigate the space in this intersection of public-private um, that, that she was interested in. Um, and then sort of finally, because sort of, it, it's kind of, it's new and fresh work, it just, just occurred, a lot. she just presented it last week. I just think it's an interesting um, example of how really, really simple things like the door handle model um, provoke a level of discussion around the studio, because she did this in the studio bathrooms, that um, has created a whole new sense of community in that studio about well, how dirty are your hands, and what do we do with our space, and what about you know, how come the bathrooms are always so messy? And um, it it's had a whole set of secondary impacts that would not have been at all predictable, but are in fact now uh, sort of fodder for her next uh, next line of investigation. So I just to prove that we actually make lots of things, I wanted to. She's somewhat of an extreme case. If all of my students did 12 prototypes in nine weeks, I'd love them. On the global issue, we're, we're, uh, we're, uh, as I said, nice thing about Stanford is you've got this just host of really smart people all over the place and in the economics department. We put together a proposal with some professors from the economics department to start tracking what we're calling, uh, you know, kind of a futures index. So I don't know about you, but a lot of the scenarios, you know, you read the peak oil books or you read all the doomsday books, and it sounds like we're heading for the third world. We're heading for some world where we all have a lot less, and it sucks, and we're all fighting over what's left. That's one version of the future that I keep reading. And to some extent, and certainly among the scientific community and my engineering colleagues, I get a sense of fatigue, like, wow, the problems are really big, and we don't have any answers, and it's just going to get worse, right? So I don't know about you, but I don't want that future. I, I don't want to buy into that future, and I don't, certainly don't want to help designing that future. And so I, and what we've been brainstorming is there must be some metric that we could create that would indicate whether we're moving in the right direction or not. And one of the things that has to happen, right, for this to be an increasing uh, uh, function, we would like to imagine that our quality of life, or certainly our children's quality of life and generations past them, it's going to be better than ours. They're going to be better educated. They're going to live more comfortably. They're going to live in safe, clean, sustainable environments. So we'd like to see the quality of life go up. But, you know, we're already, if you look at the world changing, you know, statistics, we're already, you know, in the U.S., consuming two and a half planets worth of resources for every person. So obviously that can't fly, and when China and India come online, we can't all be, you know, using two and a half planets because there is only one. So somehow or other we're going to have to use many, many fewer resources, like a tenth of what we currently use. So this is going to have to get smaller, and the numerator is going to have to get bigger for this index to go up. So we're working with some guys in the economics department to put together a proposal, a grant, and some stuff to start tracking. Because quality of life you can measure in a bunch of different direct dimensions. And you need to look at all the populations on the planet, not just the 10% that live in you know, relative luxury, but the 90% that don't, who are the important people to be designing for. And we've got to figure out, you know, as we're starting to understand what is the actual resource consumption from cradle to grave of anything we do, some metrics are you know, emerging around that, certainly around energy and how you create energy and whether corn, you know, makes more energy in a gallon of ethanol than you use and all that stuff. So you start looking at those metrics and you start publishing an index. Like, is the future going to be better? And obviously bigger numbers are good. Everybody knows that, so it'll be simple. It's kind of like when the atomic scientists started, you know, the clock about, like, how many... How many minutes before doomsday? You know, we were three minutes, two minutes before doomsday, and now I think we're actually at like 20 minutes before doomsday. So everybody knows it's better, right? So we're, you know, um, and, and economists love something when you, can, when you either use the word index or futures in it. So we thought they'd get excited, and they have. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a, a sort of a very global level how you could use um, 
design, almost just the graphic display of, 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 of numerical information to sort of encourage a result that you hope for in the future. I'll just sort of toss that out as one. Um, you know, and, and to solve these kinds of problems, you've got to look at the human issues, the technology, and the business issues, and, and the larger context in which that works. Um, we're looking at sort of designing new experiences and paradigms, and, you know, one side of the research house is looking at the methodologies that create those or the systems and strategies. Um, I think you have, you have to have something, you have to have one slide that talks about you guys, right? So. So what's interesting, what's interesting about what Microsoft has done, you know, really Microsoft, not probably, it wouldn't have happened any other way because, you know, you really did, you know, there's lots of people who would like to claim that they invented the personal computer, but, but all the personal computers in the world, except for a statistically small number of ones from Cupertino, are uh, Microsoft personal computers. So you really created this this thing. And it is the one thing where if you examine the sort of futures index of, of computing, we have tremendous optimism. Computing has gotten better and better. It's not, it's not as good as it could be, but it's gotten better and better. The quality of the experience and the amount of information and the quality of the data and the, and the, the screens and the storage and everything, it's, gotten all, it's all gotten better. And it's gotten cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And this index has been going up, you know, kind of astronomically. And we would predict that would be the case in the future. So, you know, bandwidth, storage, displays, in, infinite's a big word. You know, when I had a, I used to have a, you know, I had a PC, you could run everything in 512K and two floppy drives, and I thought that was hot, man. You could, you could, you didn't have to keep putting the floppy back in to copy programs, because you had two. And that seemed infinite at that time to me. And now this thing seems so damn slow, I can't, you know, can't move video around on it fast enough. But um, it's going to get bigger, and it's going to get better, and so it's going to be a huge part of the leverage. And the fact that information, you know, it's, it's gonna, <laughs> information is going to be everywhere, so it's harder and harder. At one level, it's easier for people to create disinformation, but it's harder and harder for politicians to lie. It's harder and harder for systems, you know, to, to not function for long periods of time without being noticed. It's harder and harder for dictators to control information. You can build firewalls, um, you know, in China, but it's not going to work. So there's going to be um, a huge technical lever, you know, a huge technological lever that uniquely, I think, Microsoft... Um, can apply to this problem and really move, you know, move something big. And um, we need new visions, particularly human-centered visions that are sustainable. The computer is the driving force. Our computation is going to be the driving force in almost every future scenario that we're looking at right now. And it's not, you know, and, and uh, I forget who said it, um, Paul Saffo is also one of our um, adjunct professor is the Institute of the Future and the Long Now Foundation guy. And uh, I don't think he said it, but he's always saying, you know, the future, the future is going to come, but it comes unevenly, right? There's, there's, you know, people, there's people where I live um, in Silicon Valley who already live completely off the grid in beautiful, you know, 4,000 square foot homes generating all of their own electricity and living in completely self-sustained environments. Now, you can't afford those homes, of course, um, but they're already living in that future. Now, all we have to do is figure out how to drop the cost about 10 percent. There are also people, you know, uh, right across the highway from me who live in a very different future right now, who live in relative poverty and with, uh, you know, poorly education, poor education prospects and no real long-term um, place in the society. So, you know, that's going to continue. It's going to be a very lumpy, dis discontinuous future. But in every one of those situations, I mean, you look at what's happening in cell phones. What's the hottest cell phone market in the world? It's India and China, and it's cell phones that cost $30. It's not iPhones and Trios. Um, it's, it's something else, right? So the future is already here. It's in various extreme user groups. You can see what they're doing and how they're doing it. And how they're leapfrogging 
technologies and making things work for them that, um, that we don't have any experience with. So the data is out there. And in all of these scenarios that we run, ubiquitous, you know, high bandwidth, everywhere, disaggregated, you know, computing is, is in every scenario and it's potentially the thing that drives radical change. Because if, if information is, is, you know, truly the thing that creates freedom, you, you, more than any other place in the, you know, place in the world, have the ability to create that um, system and information for people because your technology is everywhere. And it's going to be something around, I know, convergence. It's, it's an old 90s word, but um, it's going to be something about how these things collide and the collision is unpredictable social, digital, physical, information, political, and the environment. Uh, 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 my favorite bumper sticker around Silicon Valley lately, you probably have it here too, is um, it's a bumper sticker you see on Priuses mostly, and it says, the Earth bats last. Right? In the bottom of the ninth, it's going to be the Earth's call, not our call on how this comes out. And there's plenty of evidence that if you get rid of all the humans on the planet, the planet's a very happy place. It does just fine. So, you know, we need some solutions to big problems. I don't want my children growing up in a world that, where there are no lights because we have no energy. There is no ability to uh, move around and see all the cultures in the world because we can't fly airplanes anymore. That's just an unacceptable future. And it's not a necessary future, right? if you take the right approach to it. So, you know, we're, we're really focused on that opportunity. Um, and we think that, you know, for a lot of reasons, this form of design thinking has a place inside, you know, the research environments. And certainly it's, it's demonstrated its abilities in the, in the commercial environment. But in research in particular, you have to start asking the right questions because there's not enough time to, you know, answer the wrong ones. Perfect timing. Questions? Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're yeah. very common. Absolutely. I mean, and then, you know, unfortunately, I'm the executive director, so I also run the uh, executive education program. Um, but, and so now you have me selling. But, um, yeah, of course. I mean, you know, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing about this other than it's, it's subtle and it's interesting and it takes effort and you're not that good at it when you start, just like you weren't that good when you picked up a saxophone for the first time, so don't expect to sit in with Miles, right? Um, but uh, you can you can learn all of this. You can not learn. You can you can take what you already do, expand how you do it. I think the biggest thing we find when we work uh, when when we're doing like classes inside companies or we're working in the executive education program where people send folks back to Stanford, and we've got some programs over at the D School, and we collaborate with you know I, I do an innovation strategic innovation class with some guys from the business school because um, they do the strategy part and I do the innovation part. When we work with folks, what we find that's missing most often is two things. One, yeah, they do this front-end stuff, and sometimes the, the way they do it needs to be tuned, but often it's disconnected from what happens next. Hey, we had a great brainstorming session. Okay, let's go back to our real jobs, right? And then we'll just kind of, you know, none of that somehow. It's, it's viewed as a separate thing, and it, it doesn't get integrated in the process. So that 
you can help with. And you know, this isn't. This is often marketing. A lot of my undergraduates, for instance, just go off to marketing jobs. They don't actually go off to design jobs because they're they're excited about working with people to uncover needs. How many? I mean, how often do you guys talk to people who aren't who are your customers? How often do, do, I mean, I find this everywhere. Engineers or engineering teams and research teams don't have an opportunity. There's no carve out in their time to talk with actual customers. And because we all use our own technology, we often think we're our customer in a way. And we are, but we aren't. Um, and best case, they think this is about, well, maybe marketing and engineering should get together and have some meetings. And marketing is, is, is great, and it's essential, and it's important, but it's generating a different data set. The data set marketing is generating is, what's the largest part of this curve? Who are, what's the majority of users doing? What's our position versus competition? What are our feature sets? Right? Very important information. If you don't know that, you're going to get killed in business. But that's, that's one slice to the data, and now another slice is, I need to, and typically we go try to find extreme user groups. I want to find people living off the grid already, doing their own solar, their own water recovery, their own everything, and I want to understand how that impacts their lifestyle because all these changes are multidimensional, and so I need to study them. They're not a statistically significant sample. They're not currently in my market. They don't buy energy from me on PG&E, um, but they're what's going to happen later, so I better figure it out now. So um, it's uh, I, well, just, I think you, it's all learnable. Of course it's all learnable. And the two parts that I find uh, often missing, and it's just structural. It's just like, well, we don't have time to go out and talk to customers. And when we do talk to customers, it's not really talking to customers. We're, we're in one of those rooms behind a mirror, and there's a focus group going on out here, which is, which is deriving a different set of data. It's not the data you need for design. It's the data you need for positioning, for branding, and other things, but it's not the data you need for design. So, sure, sure. Yeah, for designers, much more useful because uh, that's where you're going to get inspiration on what to do that hasn't been done before. And uh, you also need to talk to people who don't use computers, and you need to talk to people who, um, you know, live in environments where computers aren't useful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That sucks, doesn't it? Yeah, I don't think moving, you know, everybody around and giving a new boss is a prototype. I think that's just kind of. <laughs> <laughs> That's more like a coup. Um, you know, uh, my ex the answer is yes, my expertise is not in that area, but we work with a lot of folks, um, both in the engineering school, who used to be you know, what was called um, uh, uh, organizational behavior you know, and, and a couple other specialties. And they're starting to look at using um, uh, prototyping in an organizational context, and so I think there is some work that's that's being done there. Um, my 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 the, uh, my intuition says it would be it would be very valuable, and again, because you're going to do some reduced dimensionality, you're not actually moving people around, but you want to have a sort of a a sense of what would the communication look like. Oftentimes, the justification for these reorganizations is. You know, we're going to reorganize so we can, you know, be closer to the customer or communicate better internally or something. So that's the rationale, but there's never any evidence that that's, uh, in fact, been determined up front or, or tried. And since people are the ultimate messy boundary condition problem, right, you don't actually know how they're going to react, could you do it? One of the things, um, I had a PhD student who just finished a thesis on uh, improv uh, and design, using improv as improv theater techniques to do um, simulations of organizational behavior. And I think it's somewhere in that area. Um, but I'm not an expert, so I can't probably 
talk about you know the stuff that has been tried that has been either successful or not. But I believe you can prototype anything. I think I heard you make a comment earlier on that design is responsible for the mess we're in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we're actually training cultures to create bigger cultures to buy more and more stuff. Yeah. How do you approach that problem? Well, you know, the history of industrial design starts in about 1900, 1905 with uh, mass market and Henry Ford saying, okay, I built all these cars, now you go figure out how to sell them. And I, it's no good to me if people just keep the same one over and over again. So change it to make them want it again. So, you know, the history of a lot of design only starts with the mass markets and mass manufacturing processes and it was built into the system to create variation to drive um, consumer um, purchasing behavior. I started out in the toy industry doing Star Wars toys at Kenner Products and then I worked at uh, Worlds of Wonder and then I did a sort of educational toy company and, uh, and then and I walked away saying I will never do toys again. Toys are, um, if you actually and all my students say, oh, I want to go work in the toy industry. And I say, no, you don't. It's the most corrupt, disgusting, hideous uh, example of why, how design is being used to destroy human, uh, you know, and human being sort of mentality on the planet. Because um, we, uh, we consciously designed toys to be about the moment of consumption, the moment of acquisition. It does you no good at all to have a kid go, I love this toy so much, I never want another one. This is the only baby doll I want. Thank you so much, Daddy, for buying me this doll. I'll keep it forever. That is not what we train children to do with toys. We, change, we train children to go, Mommy, 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 I want this toy, I want this toy, I want this toy. You know, walk down any aisle in Toys R Us right about now and listen to the kids screaming. 60% of consumer products, 70% of toys are purchased for Christmas, and 50% of all toys are in landfills within six months of Christmas Day. It's about training children to be consumers in this society. So is that something you want to participate in once you kind of know what it's all about? I don't think so. So what can you do? Um, and it's not, I mean, designers didn't create this problem. That's a grand statement. But we certainly, you know, if you choose to work on toys, you're not helping any, right? You could choose to work on education. That would be a better, maybe a better choice. You may decide to choose something else. Um, and, you know, and it's, I, it's not, my, I'm not trying to say my value system says what you should do. You have to just sort of examine the problem. But it, these, these contradictions are becoming more and more obvious. You can't, everyone cannot buy one of everything, and, and have this system work. Uh, the guys at World Changing, who's this you know, website and, and uh, resource for sustainability, um, did a, did a, had a startling statistic, you know, um, power drills. You go down, I, I need to drill a hole, go down to Home Depot, buy yourself a Black & Decker drill. Um, average life, the average usage of a power drill is 23 minutes. Most people have a power, have a drill, and most of those drills have only been turned on for 23 minutes in the entire life cycle. And then they're thrown out and they buy a new one. So what's that all about? Well, that's, you know, about consumer culture. That's about people uh, needing to own, to possess, to have, to express themselves through things. There's probably better ways. And in the, in the equation that says, you know, we can have a better life with and use less stuff, um, that better life, probably part of what changes is the notion of what I need to own, what I need to rent or use, borrow, share, and what can be in the common, right? And and design has to reflect that change, because because you know Raymond Lowy and those guys started the profession to um, drive the engine of consumption, not the engine of sustainability. We need to re-examine that and retrain. Don't you think? <laughs> yeah, it sounds <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, we've also, the whole branding thing and everything, right, it's all about the next model, the next feature. The, I mean, look at how many iPod cases there are. Hmm, yeah. I know, I know. And the whole engine, not even just design, but... I, yeah, I know, I know. It, you know, it's the reason people add features to products. 
they were just perfectly good the way they were before. You know, got to sell them again. I, I, I'm, I'm, I understand that that would be a significant impact to the business model here, but you're gonna, you know, if you don't, if if some, if, you know, if you don't do it, somebody else will do it for you. Does that mean you don't believe in improvement? Oh, I believe in improvement, absolutely. But I think I believe that the new optimization is around cradle to cradle. It's not around right now. If you look at uh, Paul Hawken, who's uh, speaking, who's teaching one of our, our, in one of our sustainability classes, you know, he proposed the notion of natural capitalism. Capitalism is fine. Just include all the costs. What was the cost of getting that crap out of the ground and turning it into plastic, rubber, you know, metal? And what's the cost of putting it back? Add all those costs in, and capitalism works just fine. And with those costs in, you'll make different choices. That's all. Sa same mechanism, same market mechanism. Just don't leave stuff off the balance sheet. That's cheating. And I think that's, that's an approach. And, and I think that then improvements are still improvements if they pencil out. Yeah, you know, and that's that's um, on, on the first side. I completely agree with you. I don't, you know, we're, and we're doing a bunch of other stuff, and I think a $150 barrel of oil will take care of that commute problem for you right away. And you're not too far from that. We're not too far from that. Um, and it'll solve the new problem. I, I still want new. I mean, even in, you look at cultures where they have almost nothing, and the crafts and the the possession of things that are new are highly refined. It's still present. It's not really Maslow's hierarchy where you don't start buying that stuff until your security and you know food and other needs are. People are are all over that hierarchy. They need self-esteem and actualization even when they have nothing. Um, so you know, but but I, I do actually think that one hundred and fifty dollar barrel of oil will pretty much change Walmart's business model. You won't be able to keep your warehouse in containers on ships in the water anymore. But um. On the other issue, that's probably the one place that I think is the, I don't know an answer, but I think is the most fascinating place to apply the technology that you guys do all the time. If you get to you know, infinite bandwidth and you know infinite storage and ubiquitous computing, can you solve the problem? And or the, other, the other question is, how come, how, come, how come video conferencing is so bad still? It was supposed to be good by now. We were supposed to have flying cars and video conferencing, and I was supposed to be able to have this meeting with you guys without flying all the way up here. And uh, that's just not there yet. And I think that's a great place for, for research, and I know it's stuff that you're, you're working on. We talked a little bit about it at lunch. Um, that, should, that should be possible, and I think there's some pretty good indication that we know why it doesn't work, what's missing in that level of communication, and, how, and then now, now how do we get there? And I don't, I don't think it actually, you know, there's always, oh, well, when we have everything we need and you can just virtually appear in the world somehow in 3D and then it'll all be great. I don't actually think you need, it needs to be that good. People are surprisingly emotional about um, stuff that's really low bandwidth um, in, in a lot of ways, right? Uh, you, know, you know, I show you a little, you know, 300 by 200 pixel grainy 10 frames a second image of a child crying. And you can't help but be moved. So there's something that we can do before it's, you know, before we have virtual, you know, uh, 
people are Star Wars transporters or whatever. But I think it's um, an area that my guess is a lot of the solutions don't work because they aren't very human. They're kind of technology push solutions. It's like, look what we can do. We can get a better picture. Look what we can do. We can get better sound. And that wasn't the actual problem in the first place. But boy, I'd love to. That's the research we, we're dying to, to do more of. Yes? Any specific examples where design thinking has helped solve the problem with uh, traditional approaches of engineering science afterwards? Well, um, uh, we, re we did redesign the experience of the emergency room at Stanford, and it's significantly better. And I'm not sure that any engineers tried to do that and failed, but it. Um, but you know, at least that was a messy situation. Um, their their uh, IDO is now working with Kaiser to um, take some of those ideas and sort of spread them across the whole healthcare regime. You know, what your, your expectation is that somebody warm and wonderful who cares a lot about how you feel is going to you know be your point of contact and guide you through the system. And so maybe that could be an avatar. Maybe that could be a virtual presence. Maybe you know something else. Some technology could solve that problem. So they're working on that. We just did a big project with PBS over at the D School. Um, and they're just looking at, you know, like how do we deliver content? The world is changing. It's not just TV anymore. And PBS is, so, you know, their, their culture is, you know, we're the sort of documentary people who go around and show you the world. But they show it to you a certain way. They've kind of been stuck in a mindset for a long time. And all this other stuff is happening. Yeah, and they went HD before everybody else, but they didn't know why. And, you know, and they're on the web, but they're not sure what, what's happening there. So, we, you know, we started working with them to sort of think about what, um, what PBS means in, you know, 100 years. Um, I, I don't know that there's any result there yet. Um, what I'm trying to understand is what is the value add that design thinking brings as opposed to what engineering and science is not able to bridge it? Like, where do you distinguish yourself? Yeah, I think I would, I would, I would, um, uh, and I, I apologize, I can only think of Apple examples, and those are bad examples to use. But where it distinguishes itself is where you have a problem where you need to have uh, an emotional connection to the solution. And, and because it starts from that human-centered sort of nuanced data set, you tend to emphasize um, the the connection right up front as you as you're building prototypes, so that tends to not get lost in the solution. Whereas if you and this is stereotypical, but if you approach purely the optimization problem or the the scientific engineering problem, I can build a better something. Give me the specification, I will build it. Um, you can accidentally lose the uh, the emotional connection. Um, so it actually takes quite a bit of discipline to take features out of a product to make it simpler to use. It runs counter to everything you think your value is as an engineer or a scientist to make something better. But um, if you approach it from a different, maybe a slightly different point of view, you, um, you, you do what economists call satisficing. It's the best possible solution if you include all the um, costs of changing and um, uh, communicating, you know, the, what's new. So I, I'm guessing, you know, it's, it's things where products have been made simpler or easier to use because they started with a, you know, a human-centered uh, ethnographic approach. A PlayStation 3 and Wii is, is an example. Certainly, where um, it's a, it's it's half the graphics power, and you know, not nearly the it, it it doesn't meet any of the specs that everybody thought the next generation game should have, and it's it's just you know it's destroying PlayStation.
I think, you know, back to the question of, you know, form follows function, right? This man drove forms follows function. But the function of products in this <laughs> complex sort of jazz world is to delight us, inspire us, engage us, you know, participate with us. I mean, function is now a very emotional connection, certainly with, if you overlay brand and everything else. And I want new things in my life. I want to have new experiences. I want to spend more time with things if they engage me that way. And I can't, get, I can't get to those levels of engagement purely by analysis. I may need to, to evoke those responses. I may need the fastest possible processor with the most, you know, efficient database and blah, 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 blah. And so there's a lot of technology and engineering that goes into them. But um, it needs some kind of, uh, you know, direction. So the direction comes from asking, you know, the questions about intention. Before you ask the questions about spec specifications, go ahead. Um, so I'm a believer in thinking, I think there's probably a few of us here. What interests me is how can we um, get the holistically integrated organizational <laughs> culture of the Microsoft? Yeah. So I'd love to get your thoughts on you know, 10 years from now, how do you envision this to be, um, you know, just how, how will we find a place in the organization? Do you think we'll have little B-suite type organizations that could act as consultants and make, make Well, there's two models in the world that, that we can point to, and, and they have very different characteristics. Um, uh, we talked a bit about you know, Apple, because I have experience there, and everybody goes, well, you know, they've got this guy who's the chief uh, kind of design guy, and, and everybody, the design comes out so good because he cares. Okay, so one model is you go get a, a, an absolutely crazy person who's mentally unbalanced and is not fun to be around, and you make him your CEO, and uh, he tells you what to do. So that's one model. Um, seems to be working, okay, in at least a small sample size. And another model is Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble was probably the most boring, staid company. Made soap, put it in different bottles, and sold it under different names, but it was just soap. And, um, and in the last uh, eight years, their stock prices tripled, and they're um, now known as one of the most innovative companies in the world. And what they did is the A.G. Lapley, who came in as the CEO, he said, innovation is going to be the game. That's how we play. You don't want to play, you're out. Um, it's like Project Glenmore, you are out. Um, but, um, but he did it in a very en encompassing way. He took all the senior management and he taught them innovation. And they worked with a bunch of outside people until they could do it themselves. They worked with IDEO and other folks um, and some, you know, some design schools and other things to sort of understand first what this culture of innovation is all about. They established a thing, I think they call it the Race Street Labs or the Something Street Labs in Cincinnati, where uh, now teams who have kind of got management buy-in about this innovation thing okay, can send their teams to this place instead of sending them you know, to IDEO or someplace expensive. They can go in-house to their own little training incubator to teach. It's like a little mini D school kind of environment. Uh, and, and it's really funky and cool and doesn't look corporate at all. And it's, you know, there's a bunch of things about environments you do to change the set as well. And um, so he's permeated it through the organization through, through by bringing first in outside people, training, then building indigenous skills, and then uh, his own training organization. And he also said 50% um, of all the good ideas come from outside the company. Outside the company. I don't want, you know, there's smart people in the world. We're too insular. I want 50% of the ideas coming from outside the company. And all the good ideas we don't use, I want them licensed out. Nothing kills creativity more than you having a good idea and the company sitting on it. Because what's the point? You don't do this for fun. You do it because it's an expression of yourself. If the company just says, thanks a lot, but we're not going to do anything with it, you're unhappy and you will disengage. So he said, all of our good ideas, if we can't use them, we license them out. And he licenses to all his competitors. So it's a completely different model. And I would argue if, uh, if Jobs and Lafley were in a plane tomorrow and the plane crashed, P&G's stock price would stay the same and Apple's would be cut in half because that system is not sustainable. One guy with a vision is not the way you're going to make this work. Certainly not, you know, in an organization this big with its, its own culture. You just start, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. Start working this way. Start getting everybody else to work this way. Get some, you need buy-in from somebody who can write a check and, you know, get the ball rolling, but 
you've got to build it, you know, laterally, and you've got to build it deeply in your own in your own group. You can do it in your own group. There's nothing that prevents you from saying, today we're not coming to work. We're going to go down to a school and watch kids play with computers. Nothing other than somebody yelling at you and telling you you can't do it. So ignore them.